Mm, yeah. I love my HBCU. Uh, and boy, boy, I love it, love it. Yeah. I love it, love it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love my HBCU. Yeah. And man, yeah. I hope my team they won one. one. Yeah. I hope my team they won one. one. Mm, yeah. Man, I hope my team they won one. one. Yeah. I hope my team they won one. one. Yeah. yeah. I tune into the HBCU Sports Lab to see if my team won a loss. If they lost, I'm quiet as a mouth. But if they won, she tell, uh, I'ma do the dab, yeah. Dr. Cavill, he know what he be talking about. Mike and Charles, they know what they be talking about. They can press the analytic data with your hip hop. If you know them like I know them, they gon' tell you if your team, if they won a loss. Yeah. And who the ball, who the ball. So listen to Professor, yes sir, yes, sir. and pay attention, Boy. cause he gonna teach a lesson. Yes. This is Dr. Cavill with Inside the HBC Sports Lab with Mike Washington, Charles Bishop. Mike Washington is out on assignment. So we brought none other than Mr. Daryl Wade, Houston Astros Youth Academy Director, and has a heavy hand in the Cassie, Cactus Jack HBCU class. We're going to get him to talk a little bit more about this. This classic and talk about these HBC programs and why this is exciting and important. With that being said, welcome to episode 362 of the Inside the HBC Sports Live Radio Show and Podcast, the show that's covering the sporting HBC dash for all things HBC sports from our institutions, large and small. From the NAIA to the NCAA, we share insights and information on the HBC sports culture, HBC athletic aesthetics to facilitate the story of HBC athletic programs in the business of HBC Sports. I'm your host, Dr. Kenyatta Cavill, along with my co-host, Mike Watch and Charles Bishop. We're filming from our home studios and sending a signal out of Case Waste 1230 AM studios with the Texas Radio Hall of Famer. That's multi-Hall of Famer, Ralph Cooper, in the beautiful home of Texas Southern University from Houston, Texas. Today's episode of Inside the HBC Sports Lab is sponsored by THG Agency, LLC. THG Agency, a company that provides sporting and education Consulting and data analytics. With that being said, welcome to the show, Mr. Daryl Wade. How you doing? I'm great. Thank you for having me on. It's our pleasure. Again, this is uh, Daryl Wade, Houston Astros Youth Academy Director. I've had many uh, great opportunities to speak with him uh, just about his love of the game, just in life in general, uh, particularly, um, and it's happy to have him here. Let me break this down a little bit as we're using this as our news uh, early part of the show when we break it down. Uh, you've heard about this, but we wanted to make sure you got a chance to really get in and talk about this. This is the Cactus Jack HBCU class is set to make its it's debut like at Minute Maid Park on Friday, February the 17th through Sunday, February the 19th. The classic will be first of its kind held in Houston, Texas, Astros hosted by MLB Urban Invitation that exclusively features historical black colleges and universities back in 2013. The inaugural nine-game tournament will feature Houston's area of Prairie v and m and Texas Southern University, and four schools from neighboring Louisiana and Mississippi that will include Southern University, Grandma State University, Jackson State University, Mississippi State University. 2,500 fans each day will receive an exclusive Travis Scott bobblehead Presented by Cactus Jack Foundation. I got to make sure I'm there early. I won't be a bobblehead. here. <laughs> so, what was the fruition of this tournament coming together? Well, I guess it started around maybe about this time last year. Uh, uh, my staff and I, uh, Dwayne Stella, we go to spring training every year with the players and uh, work, work with the, the manager and the coach. So we were having a just a brief discussion with Dusty Baker about the possibility of having a HBCU uh, tournament here in Houston. And of course he said, yeah, y'all need to try to do that. Uh, we came back we had a new boss and uh, we went to her before we could finish the conversation. She said, let's do it. Uh, we started off going to have a small, <laughs> small schools, you know, like uh, some of the small schools around Texas. And, uh, we realized that Texas Southern being two minutes away from the stadium, three minutes away from the stadium, it didn't make a lot of sense not to include them. Then we said, well, Prairie View is local too. So we got them, started thinking about them. Then we realized, well, let's try to go all D1. And that's what we did. We reached out to those other four schools. They all jumped on board, signed contracts to be here. So we were really excited about this opportunity. 
to put it on. We are, well, we know of the only one that has had a complete HBCU roster and uh, especially playing mm-hmm. in the Major League Ballpark. So we're excited about that opportunity. Uh, and no, Dusty said it best that during the right before the World Series that for the first time in many years, no African American would take the field in a World Series game. And uh, not that this term is going to change that immediately, but I think it'll give our kids more of an opportunity to need to be seen on the national level. Uh, we have a broadcast nationally on Saturday, so all those teams will get to play on national TV, and then uh, our local uh, sports are going to carry it to the five-state network. So all those schools will get those games back at their uh, campus in that city. Yeah, so excuse my rudeness. I should have made sure I said that uh, – they're away with the MLB champions, world champion, Houston Astros. Right. Make sure I put that out there. As you talk about Dusty Baker um, and his support and actually saying, yeah, let's do that. I know that's usually a part of their um, training camp. Uh, is he going to be able to be involved in any way, um, whether sending a message or something? Of that well, nature? Dusty has never missed spring training, as he told me last week. But right now, there's a possibility that they're going to fly him back to at least meet with the team and players uh, Thursday night as we have a team reception here. Uh, if not, we're going to try our best to get Dana Brown to come down. But uh, we're thinking that, that Dusty will, might be here. Reggie Jackson will definitely be there speaking to the kid. Uh, so we're excited about the opportunity we have for these kids to see, you know, Dusty hopefully and for sure, you know, the only black uh, general manager in Major League Baseball, and then, of course, Hall of Famer Reggie Jackson. We're speaking with Daryl Wade, Houston Astros Youth Academy Director. We're talking about Astros Foundation Cactus Jack HBCU Classics set for February 17th through the 19th, 2023. As you know, Minute Maid Park, home of the World Series champion, Houston Astros. Charles, you want to ask a follow-up question? Yeah, I wanted to ask, uh, and we've seen classics uh, with regards to football, even basketball, but the uniqueness of the, the classic uh, in, in this baseball uh, round. I wanted to ask this question, um, uh, especially with the Astros now with a, a black uh, a GM, how important is it uh, with, with regards to this classic in terms of connecting uh, baseball with the African-American community? Well, as you, we all know, baseball is – probably the least attended by African Americans probably, but we have, we feel like we're going to try to make this event uh, a homecoming, a homecoming type event, like an HBCU homecoming event. Um, we have to, we know we have to get the community to come out and support it. We have a, a sponsor and we have a three-year deal there, but, you know, that first year is going to make the second and third year. So we're hopeful that we can get enough energy around. We have reached out to, uh, schools, everyone, but we reached out to the, the Divine Nine of the Panhellenic Council here in the Houston area, uh, HBCU News in general, HBCU alumni chapters, the Houston area alumni chapters. So we're hopefully that these people will be the ones that will come out and, and support us and champion this event for us. Yeah, you got some of the best programs in the SWAC um, in terms of that and Maybe that's a little bias on my part, but uh, with that being said, when you talk about some of the events, obviously you have the nine games, uh, exciting Division One college baseball, high school students, college fairs involved, a gospel breakfast, bobblehead giveaways each day, uh, ticket packages and suites are available for those that like to highlight, vendor booths and company sponsorship opportunities are available as well for those that want to get their merchandise out to potential customers, uh, fun for the whole family. And so when you break it down, you have the Friday games that start at 11, uh, last game capping off at 7 o'clock. But then Saturday is when you have the Astros Youth Academy College Fair, which starts at 10 o'clock. And then you have your game starting at 11, similar to Friday, with the night capper starting at 7 o'clock uh, on Sunday. And at 7 o'clock night capper, I'd be remiss if I can say that. First on Friday, that last game features Southern and Jackson State. Just two years ago, they had a classic – uh, championship game that featured Jackson State and Southern uh, in terms of that matchup that uh, uh, is kind of a sore spot for Charles, so I won't visit it too much. But it was a great <laughs> game, as you would say. Uh, on Saturday night, you have, as you said, the local teams fighting off, which is always a big rival with Prairie View and Texas Southern. 
We just saw it on the basketball court, a double overtime. So if baseball is anyway, you might get a couple of extra innings in that one. There's always a great contest between those teams over the years. And then on Sunday, um, you start at nine with the Astros Foundation Gospel Breakfast. That should be fascinating and excellent to see. Uh, with that game featuring tonight, Texas Southern at seven o'clock will face Southern, which has been a rival in itself. So big time matchups. Uh, all through the game, you have Mississippi Valley State, Jackson State matching up in terms of Mississippi, uh, which is on Saturday morning, uh, as well as having uh, Grambling Prairie View matchups is always good. So fascinating to see that. Three o'clock Southern, Grambling on, on Friday. I mean, on Saturday, I should say. So you have all the mixes for these big time games and for folks, they can see it there. Uh, talk about some of these events that you are putting around this and why they're so important and unique. Okay, I'm going to talk about those events, but I'd like to say, you know, we, we, we saw the poll that came out a few weeks Go ago. Ahead. We have five of the top ten teams on the on the poll that I can turn to excited about that, you know. <laughs> uh, you being yeah, number, that's the Black College uh, Nine poll rankings, right? Correct. And so that, that's, you know, we didn't plan it that way, but we're glad to see it that way. But, you know, as I mentioned earlier, we're trying to make this a, a community-type event, so we thought it was important. That, uh, we were really, you know, thinking about, you know, getting fans out and getting everyone involved. So that's why we came up with all these uh, different events. The college fair is something that, you know, we've been doing here at the Astros and the Foundation and the Academy for several years. And we just, uh, we've done it in November and January. So this year we decided we'd bring it into our term to try to, to make it there. We have over 80 schools already signed up to come. Uh, and it's not just the small schools. We have you know large schools all across the country coming. Uh, we have well over 400 students registered to come from high schools around the city of Houston. So we're excited about that as well. Uh, Saturday night, we're going to have uh, the whole school birthday party here at the stadium in the Gallagher Club. It's actually our boss. <laughs> Paula Harris's birthday that Friday. We're gonna have a big bash for her. And there's tickets for that, but all proceeds will go back to the academy and the foundation. So we're excited about that. Uh, as I said, we got to get people out here. You know, on Sundays we like to go to church. So we were hoping to still get people out if they'll come to our gospel breakfast. We'll uh, have a comedian, uh, national comedian Marcus D. Wiley, who's a local guy, who's gonna perform for our gospel breakfast, and we're excited about that. There are tickets available for that. But with that ticket, you get to go get to all the games on Sunday. Uh, ticket prices are ten dollars a day, and I don't think you can beat that anywhere in, uh, right now for a college baseball game, especially three. Oh, good stuff, good stuff. Uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't give you a chance to put out there anything that we didn't ask you at this time. I, I think we covered it pretty good. But one thing that we are doing, and it, it's not something that we've kind of publicized, but we have. Reach out to all the universities uh, with these athletes, not just baseball athletes. If they will send us their resume, we're going to put up a virtual uh, book and send it to all of our corporate sponsors as oh, well yeah. as League baseball to try to help these young men and young women and these schools get an opportunity to get a high paying job for these major corporations and, of course, in Major League Baseball. You know, here, you know, I'm, I'm getting a little older, but I tell everyone that I get to hire at the academy, I'll help you get in the door, but I want you to go down the hall. So hopefully, they, you know, some of these young people will get to go and, and be another general manager someday. So those are the kind of things we're trying to do. This is, uh, I hate to say we're, we're not trying to make money, but we're trying to, to make an opportunity for all these kids, not just the, the players, you know. Out of those teams, kids, how many will get drafted? Probably not that many, but all of them say they played amazing ball for one day. Oh, yeah, it's beautiful. Uh, as we let you go, uh, we'd love to get you back on as we get closer to the event, maybe get some updates and see how things are going. Uh, uh, we might even get a chance if we can work together, maybe even to do a show and do a couple of interviews from dignitaries at the event. We'll see if that sure. makes sense for you and if that will work for you. We, we'd love to do this. We think this is a great opportunity for HBCU Classics when we get a chance maybe to bring you back on. We'll start talking about your connection with HBCUs and how you even got into baseball. But in this one, I wanted to make sure we got the int uh, information out on the 2023 Astros Foundation Caster Jack HBCU Classic. 
We appreciate that. I want to say thank you. We really appreciate the opportunity. And uh, it was our pleasure. I need a copy of that uh, HBCU uh, photograph you had up behind me <laughs> from my office. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you like that? I'll see if I, I can make that happen. For somebody like you, you deserve it. I, 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 I I'd love to be able to put that here in my office at Minute Maid Park. would be great. All right. That, All right. That'll work. No doubt about it. Thank you, uh, Thank Mr. You. Wade. We'll be right back after this quick break. Charmin Ultra Soft has so much cushiony softness, it's hard for your family to remember. They can use less. Sweet pillars of softness. This is soft. Holy Charmin. Oh, excuse me. Roll it back, everybody. Sorry. Charmin Ultra Soft is so cushiony soft, you'll want more. But it's so absorbent, you can use less. So it's always worth it. Now, what did we learn about using less? You gotta roll everybody <laughs> we all go why not enjoy the go with Charmin since 2002 empowerment resources Inc a nonprofit organization has empowered more than 1500 youth and adults in Duval and surrounding counties through its programs journey into womanhood girls mentoring life skills for teens and parenting education coaching to get involved with programs volunteer or donate visit www.empowermentresourcesinc.org follow us on social media facebook.com forward slash empowerment dot resources and instagram.com forward slash empowerment j-a-x t madden and associates is a sophisticated and experienced law firm located in your neighborhood we're turning injury to cash T. Madden and his associates obtained almost $2 million for my injury. They turned my injury to cash. Now, we can't guarantee how much your injury is worth, but we've recovered millions for our clients. Call T. Madden and Associates at 833-PAID-123. That's 833-PAID-123. Press the analytic data with your hip hop. If you know them like I know them, they gon' tell you if your team, if they wanna love ya, yeah. and who the ball, ball, ball. So listen to Professor Yes Sir, yes, and pay attention, boy. cause he gon' teach a lesson. Yes. This is Dr. Bill with Inside HBC Sports Lab. We're back with Charles Bishop and A.D. Drew. Uh, and we're going to get into the mid-major women's ranking. We're going to do a little different today. We're going to give you both in this segment, women's and men's mid-major. We'll start out with the women's, and we're going to get the gentlemen to say what they think about my top five on the mid-major level. You know, early this week, uh, Mike went in, so I had to cut off his mic and send him on his way. We'll see if we bring him back. He came back a little dust up, and so I, I need to let him know who, who, who owns the mic around this place. We'll see if 82 can handle himself. Uh, if he wants some of this. Dropping out this week is Florida Memorial Lions sitting at 14 and 5, 83. Receiving votes is Savannah State Tigers sitting at 14 and 6 and 10 and 5 with 10. Miles Bear sitting at 14 and 6, 10 and 5 at 9. Florida Memorial Lions sit at 14 and 5 at 8 and 3. Let's get in the top five. As you see, one team jumped out. But at number five, Lincoln, Pennsylvania, the Lions out of the CIAA are 15 and 6, 9 and 2. They stay at number five, but they're solidly in the poll at 31 points. At number four, though, Fayetteville State Broncos out of the CIAA uh, jump in the poll, 13 and 6, 9 and 2, 33 points, as they were not ranked last week, but they jump in at number four. At number three, West Virginia State Yellow Jackets sit at 16 and 3, 11 and 3, 43 points. They remain in the three spot, bringing us to number two. The Russ Bearcats had a great week. They were all, but they still, with everybody else fluctuating, they were able to move up. They moved up two spots, 13-3, and 7-0, undefeated at 54 points, uh, chasing down number one out of the SIAC, the only SIAC team, but they're at the very top, is Tuskegee Golden Tigers sitting at 17-3, 14-0, undefeated in SIAC play as of uh, Monday. 
they have six points, 60 points as they continue to get it done. We're going to jump to the men's, and then I'm going to get your thoughts on either or both of these poll rankings. In terms of the men's, in week number four, Kat Claflin, uh, as they drop out of the polls, uh, receiving votes are none other than Claflin Panthers. They're still at the top mm-hmm. receiving votes, so they just dropped out. Basically, number six, if you would. 15 and 4, 7 and 4, 25 points. Tuskegee Golden Tigers are uh, receiving votes at 16 and 6, 11 and 4. Miles Golden Bears sit at 16 and 5, 12 and 4. Uh, A.B. Drew talked about this last week, um, really about that rivalry, and it was a good one down there as Charles got to be a part of the play by play of that matchup, uh, getting it done in so many days. It was in so many ways, I should say. Uh, as Mo Carter was also doing his thing as the commentator there. Winston-Salem State Rams, 15 and 5, 7 and 4, are outside looking into the top five. So who are the top five? We have a new one at number five this week, Philanda Smith Panthers. 15 and 3, 5, Ooh. 7 and 2, 45 points. They were not in the top five, but they find a way in as Claflin falls out. At number four, you have Savannah State Tigers, 14 and 6, 12 and 4. They move up a spot from number five with 54 points as they're still rolling. At number three, you have Virginia Union Panthers sit at 18 and 4, 18 and 2, playing some good basketball out of CIAA, 58 points. They move up a slot from number four last week. Bring us to number two, Tougaloo Bulldogs, 19 and 1, 7 and 0 as they're undefeated. Three first place votes are looking solid. Uh, they caught up a little bit with Langston, but not enough to close the gap. 75 points, but still remain at number two. Langston Lions continue to roll. First team, 20 victories in our men's poll rankings. That's Division One or Division Two in IA for that matter. They said at 21 wins, just one loss, 15 and one, five first place votes, 78 points, and they are at number one, getting it done. So you see, Langston Lions remain number one in week number four as much as Tuskegee Golden Tigers do as well as the women. Let me go to you, Charles, first. Men's and women's, what do you think about the poll rankings, Charles? Uh, I think you're on, on target with the uh, with the women's uh, poll rankings. Uh, watch Tuskegee up close. They, they play some tremendous basketball. Curious, no Winston, no mention for Winston-Salem State. They're right there on the heels of Fayetteville State, both 4-1 and one in conference play. I saw Fayetteville State was able to make it uh, uh, into the uh, conference rankings. But I, I like where you're going. I, I like it this week. I definitely think Russ, uh, with a week off, uh, they, they held, held position, if, if you will. And then uh, Tuskegee playing some tremendous basketball. Uh, you take a look at them. They're 91 over the last 10. They won eight in a row. Uh, you have very few teams playing as hot as they are right now. So shout out to both men's and women's programs at Tuskegee. I saw the men's hey, get some you- uh, yeah, yeah, get some love in there uh, on the men's side as well. So good poll as well. Charles, while I got a little time here, I want to ask you, what? how was your experience down there? You know, you and Miles, Birmingham, oh, man. you had the robbery game. And so we don't always get a chance to talk in this depth. Obviously, we are embedded in the SWAC territory, so we get to feel the vibe. You know, this week we just had Prairie View um, and Texas Southern. And the men's side went to mm-hmm. double overtime, and the women's game was pretty close for a while. It's pretty kind of stretched out late. Uh, but you saw the atmosphere here. Talk about the atmosphere, if you would, in regards to Miles Tuskegee. And I'll ask the same for Drew as well. It was electric, uh, Dr. Cabello. When you talk about uh, two rival teams uh, and with the crowd sitting down on top of you, uh, I have to be anytime a ball rolled out of bounds, student section was going to pop up and be in somebody's face. Uh, and that, that's how close uh, you are on the action. And uh, it was a rivalry in every sense of the word. I mean, uh, I, I, it's been a long time since I've seen that amount of vitriol uh, that was going on <laughs> in the game, after the game, you know, uh, so much so to the point where Miles Coach, I mean, he really had to literally just decompress for about a good 45 minutes after the game, just sat there, just stared off into space. I was like, okay, this is what a rivalry is supposed to look like. So I enjoyed it very much. Uh, I take my hat off to uh, uh, Miles uh, for the hospitality down there. Great atmosphere with Miles and Tuskegee. Man, I'm glad you got the experience. I'm glad you shared it with us. Before I get you in the poll ranking, AD Drew, talk about your experiences. You know, Charles gets to see it by as a visitor. You know, a commentator doing the color did an excellent job, I must say. I'll make sure you you don't tell him I said that. 
Uh, but, <laughs> <laughs> oh, I forgot he's right here. I was listening at it during the prayer view stuff. So, um, and everybody around, I told them uh, that you were doing your thing. But, hey, did you, if you would talk a little bit about this rivalry, because everybody doesn't, everybody really thinks their rivalry is the best. Rightfully so, it's their rivalry. But we get a chance to expose it from a different perspective. And you being alum, you've been in there and coaching. Talk about how intense this Miles College Tuskegee University rivalry is. Both men's and women's, really any sport, I should say. Yeah, you know, I've I've been on all sides of this rivalry. I've been there, I've been there as as a coach, I've been there as a just a fan. And then I've also been a part of this rivalry as a member of the media. So I have seen all all sides of this rivalry. I mentioned this to Charles, you know, when I was coaching at Tuskegee, we never played in Knoxville Gymnasium where that game was at. So honestly, mm. that was the first time that I actually experienced that rivalry on the campus of Biles College. I have been to games in that facility, but it was never wow. our game. It was never a Tuskegee game because that game always got moved to a larger venue because of the crowd. Dr. Kabir, that was a fire marshal game. Yes. If there was one other body in that building, somewhat, the fire marshal would have been there and said, put the ball down, everybody go home. That time, that time, <laughs> time people, people were outside. We found out people were outside watching Charles and Bo call the game on their phones, waiting on, you, you ever been to the club and the club is so packed? And you just gotta wait on somebody to go to their car so you can come in and take their spot. <laughs> That's what that was. Like, hey, hey, all right, we got two spaces, two up, two up. Yeah, that, two. I got two. I got room for two. Yeah. That's exactly what that was. And oh, I love it. I also I love it. also describe this is Biles Gym is a classic CIAA gym in Alabama. Mm. So if you've ever been to them old love the old style CIAA gym before a few people started re rebuilding, or even some of the older mm -hmm. gyms in the SWAC and, and everything. That is what that is. That is a classic gym. Everybody's on there. about two feet from the baseline to the wall, about, a, about yeah. three, four feet from the. There's literally about three feet behind the benches and the first and the first row of the bleachers. So, you know, it it it, it was all that uh, we had. A, we had a. The Tuskegee player got got teed up when he he went to save the ball, threw the ball in, wound up in wound up in about the third row, and next next thing you know, there was conversations going on between that. They had they had <laughs> they had to come and put a the security had to come put a wall up between the student section and the players to get it going. And when he came back down the court and made a play, coming back down a couple a couple of possessions later, he turned around and said something to the student section, and the referee teed him up for talking to the fan. That's what you call a rival. <laughs> that's that's right. So, that's right. That's a rival. But, but get get so on these polls and tell us what you think about the poll ring. Get on these polls. I'm not going. I'm not going to be too long winded on these polls because honestly, Doc, we are really splitting hairs mm -hmm. on this men's and this this women polls. There are so many good teams, not only in your top I five, agree. but 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 in your receiving votes. So just for conversation. I'm going to uh, I'm going to really try to split some hairs here. What did Florida Memorial do to to drop all the way out, Doctor Cavill? You know, I, I might they consider just, leaving. Just one loss, exactly. Just one loss. Exactly. Like yeah, you know, I might, right. I might have left Florida Memorial in there. Fayetteville, Lincoln, Florida Memorial. You, it, it, it's really just reaching to that, reaching to the hat, and which name you pull out, that's the one that gets left out. You know, with those, with those three right there, no uh, four, five, six. On the on the men's side, it's kind of hard for me, and and I'm being an SIAC homer uh, on this one right now, Doctor Kavir. It's kind of hard for me not to have Tuskegee, mm -hmm. uh, Tuskegee in there in the top five. And possibly Miles sitting right there behind him. You can't put Miles ahead. Miles is a good team because Tuskegee has yeah. a sweep. Miles does the one thing that will win them that tournament. They play defense. They play defense and great hard those defense. Yeah, Tuskegee so, plays good defense. Oh, who do you bump out? Philander Smith. You bump out Philander Smith. I would Tuskegee? actually take Philander and Savannah out and put both those in with Tuskegee okay. at four. 
at miles and five. No disrespect so to, you, Fl- to Flanders Peter Smith and Savannah. In the East right now. I, 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 I really do think S- S- I C X. Yeah. So I'll take that. I'll take that. I, I, I really do think the West okay, is stronger. Stuff. Nobody's gonna want to play either one of those, those two teams in the tournament. You do not want to. You do not want to be that team from the East that has to face them in the tournament because there's a real serious path. Those two may be in the finals. Uh, I'm just being real. Those are probably the top two teams in the conference right now. No disrespect to Savannah State, but Savannah State hasn't mm-hmm. been challenged on the East side like those two teams have been challenged on the West. I like it. I like it. I appreciate it. We'll take this quick break, but uh, AD he just gave you a lesson in regards to old school, why they call them the cages. Remember, if you go back to your old newspapers and talk about the Black Five, they used to call them the cages. Yeah. They played in these band boxes that almost felt like a cage, and literally sometimes they did have cages uh, to protect the fans, and so uh, interesting. It seems like uh, if you go back to the Miles College, if they have to play in that facility, you might need to put up the cages again. Uh, not not <laughs> UFC. Anything bad. Just need insurance to protect folks. That's how it is. But great, <laughs> great, great stuff. Great breakdown. But both y'all, stick with us. We'll be right back on the other side. We're going to bring you a little early football. Yes, yesterday was signing the day. We're going to bring in the gurus, X's and O's. You know them as BJ Jones and Joshua Sim Seniors. We'll bring them back on the other side with these gentlemen. We'll talk a little bit about the signing uh, and see what it looks like. Stick with us. We'll be right back after this break. Your ad could be ran here. MyJBN.com backslash support. MyJBN.com backslash support for more information. Free driving offers the most advanced and luxurious pickup in its class. Yeah, it rocks. From novice to aficionado, find yourself here. High quality cigars plus personal customer service. Slowburn is Waco's only mobile cigar lounge, featuring a meticulous curated collection of premium cigars. Visit our website www.slowburnwaco.com That's www.slowburnwaco.com Supermarket sushi, really? No. Wait, Troy, you work here? I'm never not working. Like head and shoulder scalp shield technology, up to 100% dandruff protection, even between washes. Never not working, huh? Oh, Troy, you're such a good teacher. Yeah, I know. (laughs) Never not working. Never not working. Never, ever not working. Are you serious? Never not working. Standard protection that's never not working. Head and shoulder scalp shield technology. It's like a loop machine. All around town, trying to get it down. With your hip-hop. If you know them like I know them, they gon' tell you if your team, if they wanna love you, and who the So listen to Professor Yes Sir, and pay attention, cause he gon' teach a lesson. Compress the analytic data with your hip-hop, if you know them like I know them. This is Dr. Bill with Inside the HBC Sports Lab. We have... X's and O's, you know them better as B.J. Jones and Joshua Sims Sr., bringing you some new framework, new way to see this. I'm excited about this project, X's and O's, and I certainly wanted to give y'all a chance to jump on here and talk a little bit about with all of us and Charles and see what he has to say about signing day. It was a big day for a lot of HBCUs, and I know you kind of open things up on HBCU nightly. For those who don't know, you can follow B.J. Jones. And Joshua Sims seniors on Twitter. They do Twitter spaces. DJ Jones uh, will do his Twitter spaces on Tuesday when he does it. Uh, and Joshua Sims senior does it on Wednesday, HBCU nightly. They'll spread it out when they're big comments and times to open it up. So you might be able to catch them other days of the week, but primarily you certainly can catch them in. And if you just follow these gentlemen, you'll certainly know when they're going to go live with the rest of their team. 
oftentimes I'm in there providing some information here and there, but I try to stay out of the way because these brothers are good at what they do. Uh, with that being said, uh, yesterday, as I continue to say, it was a big day for a lot of institutions, or at least excitement for a lot of folks. And it's good when you get African-American black people uh, excited. We get a chance to smile because oftentimes uh, we're dealing with other things in this world that doesn't allow us to smile as much as I think we should. So most folks were smiling. I guess there's probably a couple out there may uh, frown think about their coaches and what they did or didn't do. Uh, but we'll get on that in terms of what that looks like. Let me start with you, Joshua. First, give some people that hadn't heard from this perspective. We kind of teased it out a little bit. Tell us what is X's and O's and what it's going to be about. Yeah, Doc, man, X's and O's is, is the brainchild of my brother B.J. Jones and myself, man. Uh, we we kind of teased it out. We've been teasing it out now for a few weeks, man. Um, All kind of bought, brought to fruition by the good Dr. Uh, Cavill. Uh, and literally, man, this is, a, this is an opportunity and a take for both uh, guys who both played in college, uh, B.J. Jones at Southern University, North Carolina Central University for myself. Both played the game, both coached the game. Uh, we actually played on two different sides of the ball. I played on the offense, which is normally the X. Um, and B.J. played on the defense side, which is mostly the O's, man. And, um, you know, it, it gives us an opportunity, or you can go vice versa. It doesn't really matter. But it gives an opportunity for us to be able to, to uh, really take the level of expertise that we have by both playing the game, coaching the game, and now being on the media side, being able to be analysts to be able to give a different layer of perspective, a different layer of insight, different different mindset, um, and really kind of a, a much more deep, deeply analytical component to the game of football, man. And so me and my brother, man, we complement each other really well, man. We complement each other like Kool-Aid and good sugar. You know, honestly, man, it's, it's a good, good <laughs> compliment. You know what I mean? And so you guys will get a chance to see both of us together in X's and O's. And this is something we rolling with, man. This is something now from now on, um, you know, I, I'm myself as well as BJ, we're conscious about the fact that, like, when they get one, they get the other. You don't get peanut butter without the jelly. You get the jelly with the peanut butter. You put it together. It's a phenomenal football-based uh, perspective conversation and sandwich, man. So uh, we're excited, man, Doc. We really are, really are excited, man. We're excited to bring this to the world, man, so they can hear us and see our perspective. I like that. I like that. B.J. Jones, share your perspective of what they can get with X's and O's. I mean, the biggest thing is, man, looking at the game um, through the eyes and the lens of what a coach a coaching staff would. Um I am guilty of still watching games that way. Um where you know I'm looking at alignments and realignments and who's adjusting, you know, who's adjusting where and you know, hey, uh that quarterback, if he looks one way, he's gonna throw that way. Almost just looking at it uh from a defensive coordinator position. Hey, what what do they look like? You know, from from guard to guard, you know, what are the tackles like? You know, are there some mismatches there? Uh, could I blitz here and exploit this? Um, that's why when you see me at games, I'm usually in the end zone because that's the view uh, that I want. And that's the view that I honestly I break the game down from. So uh, taking this game that we all know and love and just bringing a different different element that a lot of people um, really don't, you know, re never really thought about or – Never had it broken down, but just breaking down the game and making it simple. And uh, I couldn't ask for a better partner in crime uh, than Josh. Uh, you know, Josh, you know, playing on the offensive side of the ball on the collegiate level, I, he has a lot of knowledge. Like, I've seen offensive playbooks in college. I'm glad I played on the defensive side of the football. Uh, but uh, we're going to have fun with it. Uh, going to have fun with it. And, People are really enjoying it already with the you know things that we've done already. Yeah, I, I will say that for sure. Uh, there's a little picture there. Uh, in the picture in the middle, uh, you have Erica uh, Howard grad that is going to kind of shepherd and see if they can keep these young men on the uh, straight and narrow, which will be certainly hard to do that. But one thing in this matchup that's always fascinating to me is, uh, B.J. Jones, I always know that you like to watch the game from the field. Same with Joshua, and, and now I get to see that because I'm always up in the booth and I like to sit back because I'm analyzing all this stuff as I do my writing and journalistic. And Charles always told me about it. It's a different perspective on the field, and obviously with what he's able to do with the pregame show, he always told me, he said, man, Kabili, it's different now. You want to get down on this field. So I'm going to go to you, Charles, to um, maybe give a little word of advice uh, as you'd have to deal with me <laughs> co host the show, all uh, right, and, I, and you've grown far exceeded any of my expectations in regards uh, 
uh, to our partnership and doing your own thing with Neely with the pregame show. I'm so excited and proud of how you took that and ran with it. And that's my same expectation for these guys. We brought them into the show, did Sunday thing. Now, don't disappear. I know how y'all, y'all get so famous, then you ain't got time for me. Don't do that. I need y'all is. But with that being said, uh, anything other than that, Charles, give them some words of wisdom, if you would, in regards to expectation. I know they've been in it, uh, but we always can share in terms of how we low and grow. Learn yeah, no, I, I think they're, they're going to enjoy the experience. They both are very passionate about, you know, football uh, with regards to uh, the respective size of the ball. And I've grown to enjoy listening to both of them break, uh, break down games. Uh, one of the big things that I, you know, had an opportunity to experience uh, being at the field level was just hearing the conversations uh, that are happening on the sidelines uh, in regards to, what is happening and what are the coaches are seeing. So uh, to just to bring out that perspective, if you can, you know, if you can dive off into that, that's always, I think, a fascinating part that I don't think fans really get an opportunity to uh, experience is just uh, the way coaches are seeing things and the way they adjust on the fly. So anytime you bring that stuff to the forefront, I, I'm sure you guys will do a tremendous job with it. I'm looking forward to uh, listening to the show and really, you know, uh, gaining a better football knowledge you know uh we can always learn even more i think i i know a little a little something but you know when i hear guys who play uh at that collegiate level it always takes it to a different level so i really appreciate what you guys are going to bring to the forefront much love Chuck. much love appreciate that Charles. oh certainly uh joshua let me ask this before we get in this top uh signing day and who y'all see as the top programs and pick on we'll do that in the next segment before we get out of here I know there was – both of y'all chimed in this, DJ Jones, which is fascinating. Uh, there was the ESPN NFL uh, lie that they do where you had the players going in and talking about these X's and O's. And, man, uh, it drew a lot of attention from a lot of folks because people don't always get to see that. And you talked about this is where we, this is where we're going, where you really get to get into X's and O's and strip the folks that want to have a little more than folks just being able to talk uh, some chatter about football, how they feel, what they see. Maybe take them in, as Charles just alluded to, those conversations on the sideline, how much coaches are actually making adjustments when fans may not think they are uh, because mm -hmm. it's not happening as fast, but they forget that you're dealing with young men uh, that do not do this professionally and get all day <laughs> to perfect their yeah. craft, that, you know, that they got to do other things and they're, they're trying oftentimes really hard. Uh, and you're talking about the mix between talented players, because to me, if you're playing on the college level, you're talented. And I don't think people understand that. Between talented players, very talented players that happen to be maybe four or five stars or have grown to four or five stars, and then the elite players, when we talk about those that make the NFL, because they are the top of the top. And we ain't even talking about the all-star, all-pro. We just talking about this level, and I think people forget that. But give us a little indication of what they look like, Joshua. Yeah, man. I mean, the, the difference in the variance in, in, in each level, man. Uh, I was a really good high school football player, right? Got to college in, and now I'm on a team with a whole bunch of guys who are really good high school football players. And then, you know, you come into a room in that on that perspective, and then you get guys who are all conference, they all American, you know, and they really, really set themselves apart. And they're really, really, really talented. Right. And then some of those guys, you get the opportunity to watch them. And they go to the next level, um, you know, and they end up going to the NFL. And those guys are exactly as you call it. You talk about the elite of the best, you know, the best of the best are the guys who get that opportunity. And the same thing happens at HBCUs. You know, for HBCUs, those guys, you look at a guy like James Houston this year who came from Jackson State, who had an opportunity to get into get into a rhythm later on in the season. The expectation was that he was able to get into a rhythm from the moment he stepped on the field. He stepped into that rhythm and finished the season really well. You know, I've already started looking and analyzing. Who are the guys who are going to be able to do that as well this season coming up? You even take another guy like a Dakobe Durant. Goes to the L.A. Rams. They don't have a great season, but he has a standout season as a rookie, as a DB. You know, he played a lot in the nickel, played a lot at, at, at the dime, and, and the Rams are known for giving a lot of different defensive looks. From an offensive perspective, uh, what you guys – what I – kind of always see and what we're always going to do because I know you use the example of what, what I posted on uh, with the NFL Live guys is I'm always still looking at the game from a coach's perspective very, very so my brother BJ Jones said man I 
Uh, I tend to not like to spend all of the game on the field. Um, I want to spend half of the game on the field, half of the game up in the box, or close as, as high as I possibly can see. Because as an offensive coordinator, the ability, my ability to make adjustments and changes from what I see from a bird's eye view is very much more in, impactful than for defensive coordinators. They got to be in the thick of it, making adjustments and making changes from what they see. They're going to be able to feel the momentum shifting of a game. It's much, di- much more different for offensive coordinator than it is a defensive coordinator. So, you know, I did, man. I was a really good high school football player, man. All conference, all region. I was the man in high school, got to college, got in a room full of guys like Giovanni Irvine and Corey Harris, all of these guys who was all conference, all I mean, all conference already by the time I stepped on, on foot on 1801 Fairwood Street. And I just had to wait my time, man. I, I found my way through, through special teams, dog. I ain't even, you know what I'm saying? I ain't, I ain't getting no passes thrown. That's, that's my real talk. Year. It's grown you know me. Mean? Mean? <laughs> hey, pull up that picture in terms of uh, the FCS top 10 list. Uh, we're going to get on the other side and talk a little bit about that. Then there was the early recruiting class, and we'll get a chance to talk even more about that. So if you can, before we go to this break, Drew, uh, pull up that uh, picture of the FCS top 10 list uh, that shows, I think, Jackson State tied at number one. It has FAMU at number three. and has Alabama A&M tied at five, and that's your top 10. Those are your three HBCUs in the top 10. So we'll talk a little bit about recruiting class and, why has it changed to make a difference and how some teams may get rated high in a recruiting class and others not, uh, but it's all a game there. So we'll get on the other side. We'll be right back and talk a little bit more about this recruiting class and see uh, what the difference is. Stay with us after this break. Thank you guys for what you do for HBCU Athletics. This is a fantastic avenue for, for, for all of us. This is our ESPN, so we, 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 we love what you guys do. Brian, AD, Roy, all you guys at BCSN, we really appreciate what it is that you guys, you guys do for us. there soon we is this the one well let's say i found the one who takes me to another level always stays calm under pressure most importantly the one that helps me discover the coolest places this sounds wonderful come outside i'll introduce you they're here definitely the one (laughs) introducing the all-new nissan frontier At CDW, we get speed as the new currency of success. Our team spends way too much time tending to outdated applications and software when they should be focused on driving application agility and innovation. CDW Amplify Development Services modernizes software and application development to help accelerate innovation and digital transformation. So you mean building new applications, UI, and mobile interfaces? Well, you said you needed to innovate more quickly. Oh, so he's a listener. To do more at scale, trust CDW Amplify Development Services. If you know them like I know them, they gon' tell you if your team, if they want a lot, yeah, and who the ball, who the ball. So listen to Professor, yes sir, yes sir, and pay attention, cause he gon' teach a lesson. This is Dr. Bill with Inside HBC Sports Lab with Mike Washington. Charles Bishop Mike is on assignment. And we have those of X's and O's, at least two of the three of the crew here, which is BJ Jones and Joshua Sim Sr., as you know more about them. With that being said, Charles, I know you wanted to add something as I teased out the top. We'll get in the end. What were you saying there? Yeah, well, I, I, I was really excited about National Recruit today, but the thing that really intrigued me was everybody putting their schedules out. And that once I started looking at the schedule, especially on one particular team, uh, it took a lot of excitement away from me because 
I saw the first four games was essentially a road game, especially looking at the number one recruiting class of Jackson State. But the first four games, literally, <laughs> was South Carolina State, FAMU, Southern. Then you get an FBS team. I was like, wait a second. What, what, what is this? So, you know, the, you guys break this thing down for me with regards to taking a look at uh, National Signing Day. But when you start kind of extrapolating stuff and looking at the schedules, you know, my heart got to beat fast real quick. So help me out, man. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was real talk. Uh, as you're doing that, I'm going to start with you, Joshua, uh, Sims, in terms of breaking it down. One thing that I noticed with this uh, recruiting class is, you know, you had the early signing period. And in the early signing period, you had actually um, Alcorn at number three. You didn't even have Alabama A&M in the top ten. Um, and so, at least according to this index, which was uh, done by uh, early signing day, per 247 sports um, opposed to light on college. So people can have a little difference, but you don't think that missed disparity. Uh, but obviously they use the three and four stars. So you get a little bit about that. And so that's the one that ranked all HBCUs where you see all corn at three uh, and you don't even have Alabama A&M in there. You have North Carolina central, obviously uh, at number eight in terms of where they were ranked uh, early signing period. It doesn't include the new one. Uh, yeah, Prairie View sticks in the 10. I know some folks at Prairie were kind of disappointed after what they saw. But then I had Luke come back and said, no, that's that actually pretty good. So you have different folks, different thoughts. Uh, let me start with you in terms of the recruiting class. Did you agree with what you've seen out there with the rankings and why and why not? You know what, Doc? Um, I, I do agree. I agree. And, and, and everybody who kind of knows uh, my approach to this, uh, I'm I'm fairly even kill on this. I agree from two fronts. One, I think there are some programs that yesterday uh, we kind of knew going into yesterday was going to make some headwaves. We already knew Jackson State and FAMU were tearing up the recruiting trail. Um, Alabama A&M, quiet is kept. Last night on HBCU Nightly, me and BJ had them on. We had Mo Carter from uh, right down there in, in Alabama A&M country, and he told us. This recruiting class is better than most people are giving credit for. So, um, and I went and looked, and he was absolutely right. Now, given it wasn't, but so far they was going to be able to go from the year previous, you know, from a recruiting class they hit the year prior. Uh, but they definitely made strides. Shout out to Coach Connell Maynard on the strides that he made there. Here's what I will say about the lack of eight of, of MEAC teams that's in that top team. Um, you, you generally are going to have MEAC programs not really make huge waves on recruit on the recruiting trail. It's just what it is. Um, Howard yesterday had a great day. I have no idea, man. I think that it, it boils down to um, a lot of the names and, and just the amount of attention that's garnered through social media and through media in general on the MEAC programs versus the SWAC programs from a recruiting standpoint. Uh, we'll see how competitive Howard's going to be. They made some big-time moves on the offensive side. Didn't make no moves on the defensive side. Morgan State plugged and played in some spots. They felt like they finally had a full recruiting season this offseason. We'll see how that ends up affecting their game. And then if you look down at 1801 Fayetteville Street, uh, you know, we made a couple moves, but nothing too loud. And then that's just the truth. North Carolina Central just didn't make a lot of loud moves. South Carolina State, for me, in my opinion, won the day for the MEAC yesterday, um, quietly. Mm -hmm. And if anybody get a chance – Go look at that class that South Carolina State signed yesterday. And you'll see exactly why. They have a replacement for Shaq down there that they signed yesterday. They have a replacement in spots that they know that they're always going to be good. And I'm hearing rumblings that their quarterback room is improved already. So South Carolina State won the day for yesterday in the act. Quite as kept. BJ Jones, same question for you, but I obviously look at it from a fat SWAT perspective. Did you agree with the rankings? Uh, did you have something off, off there? Uh, what are your thoughts in terms of what took place yesterday? Not just with the rankings, but overall. Oh. No, I agree with the rankings. I knew that um, T.C. Taylor and Jackson State, they had a, a big task in front of them. Um, lost a nice little portion of their roster, but they did a good, great job of replacing those guys, man. I'm excited about um, a few players that Jackson State was able to go and get. And then FAMU, man, FAMU, uh, they lit it up. Um, and I, I think that this is the year that a lot of the, the orange and green faithful they're looking at this year as probably, if not now, then when, if ever. 
mm. uh, because I mean they they have that type of talent uh, down there. Uh, a, a team that I think people are sleeping on from a recruiting standpoint is all. Um, I like what they did in the early signing period. I like the way that they closed late. Alabama and them sneaky, you know, has a sneaky good class. Um, and I will say the same thing about Alabama State as well. They come along, they came uh, along late, but if you look at some of the guys that they brought in, they brought in guys that that are close to competing for jobs day one uh, on campus, and, and, mm. and that's huge. Mm. Charles, you want to jump in and ask a follow question? Yeah, actually, actually, Alabama State is the one that I'm real curious about because I thought uh, when you take a look, especially at the SWAC East, that they are that they were they're they're coming. You know, they're 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 right there. I saw with that defense last year with the big corners and the physicality. Uh, I saw you know what what they're trying to do down there. So I was really curious in terms of what Alabama State was uh, able to do yesterday, BJ. Man, they hit a, they hit a hard on the defensive side. Uh, you saw them really show up on the defensive line. They went, um, they hit the receiver side hard. Um, I mean, they lost Jeremiah Hicks, and he's now in New, uh, New Mexico. Um, their, their their best receiver and the kid that wore uh, eighty, um, he was I think just a freshman or sophomore last year. Uh, you did see them bring in the junior college quarterback. They lose Miles Crawley to Grambling. Uh, but then they bring in a, a junior college quarterback uh, that has an arm and, and, and that can, can sling it around the yard a little bit, uh, and they address the, the the running back role. Um, Santo Dunn did a lot for them um, a year ago. I think that he was a, a, a one year guy grad transfer. Um, so they go in and they refresh that. So if they can get that quarterback position figured out, uh, Alabama State is a dangerous football team. Let, let me let me follow that up uh, and ask this media question, Josh. Uh, Norfolk State wholesale changes uh, yesterday with regards to what they brought in. Uh, who is that team that could actually challenge North Carolina Central uh, in, in the media? Yeah, man. Um, um, to, to your point about Norfolk State, uh, before I get to what I what I who I believe can challenge North Carolina Central, Norfolk State signs thirty eight guys yesterday. And from what yeah. I'm hearing, they're not done. I'm hearing that they're looking to sign even more kids um, between now and that um, the next transfer portal period. Um, mm-hmm. Norfolk State is going to look like a completely different team this year. Dawson Oldham is going to have the task of trying to put together this roster, even during the spring with the guys he's got that's early enrolled, that just to get some sort of camaraderie in motion movement. I still believe they're about two or three years away from being able to compete. Um, but I think that when you see a move like this, it's intentional. Very similar, if I have to say so myself, to what Connell Maynard did last year. You bring in a whole brand new, essentially brand new class of, of guys last year, what Connell Maynard did. And then in his second recruiting class post that, in his first recruiting class post that, he puts together a top 10 recruiting class. And so the same thing is going to be expected of Dawson Odoms. This recruiting class is not going to be the recruiting class that's going to compete. But to your question about, Who's the team that I believe that can compete mm-hmm. with North Carolina Central for the MEAC? It's two teams. The first is Howard. And I know, I know, brother, Big Mike ain't on here. He can't say it. I'm going to say it for him. Howard? Yeah, Howard. <laughs> they have already, they already had last year, and I want everybody to keep in mind this, they already had a very young offensive line last year of some really big and talented guys that can move. They found their way around yeah, being did. able to create space and get hands on guys, and it was really insightful to see. Now, their defensive side of the ball is their defensive side of the ball, and I'm not quite sure why they didn't go and recruit hard on the defensive side of the ball because, for me, I felt like that was the biggest question mark. You got Q Williams coming back next year. He's going to have another uh, spring to develop. You got a much better offensive line, much better targets on the outside, and a really good running back room. I'm not understanding why he's not able – why they didn't go get guys on the defensive side. But the second team is a team that everybody knows. They're the big bad wolf. They're the boogeyman of the conference. And they're the team that we just haven't found a way to beat. South Carolina State. And I'm going to say it Mm. now. I'm going to say it once we get to the spring. I'm going to say it in the summer. And as we get to the season, if North Carolina Central wants to cement themselves as the top dog in the conference next year, going into MEAC play, they're going to have to beat South Carolina State October the 25th. They've got South Carolina State second circled. on their MEAC schedule, yeah. circled, yeah. and they're coming to Durham. Mm-hmm. And they're going to have a much improved defense, even though they lost a couple guys. I think that defense is going to be better than it was last year. Now, the biggest question for 
any of these other programs is what are they going to do in the quarterback room? Who's got an improved quarterback room? And if, if, if Corey Fields is not the guy or whoever it is that's in that quarterback room down there in South Carolina State, if they're not the person, they're going to find out fairly quick with their schedule too, Chuck, because you talked about y'all. Their schedule is going to put some people in some hot fire early and often, and then you got to try to come up to Durham and try to knock off the dogs. Doc, let me follow up with this real quick question, and it, it revolves around the regionality of recruiting. And I wanted to ask this question. Uh, BJ, you know this well. Guys grew up in the South essentially want to play in the SEC conference. Uh, uh, and I've, I've often been curious about this. And you may mention, uh, you know, recruiting uh, in the MIAC, it is what it is. Uh, maybe not as flashy or whatever the case might be. But is there a good wellspring of players who want to be at North Carolina Central, at South Carolina State, at Howard, uh, at Norfolk State? Uh, might not be, uh, you know, quote, unquote, as flashy even sometimes as uh, being within the, 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 the southern region. Uh, in terms of guys want to play, you know, um, at, at, at power five schools. But i uh, curious, uh, do you get a better caliber player? Because we're starting to see it play out in the celebration ball. Absolutely, 100%. Um, you know, we have the benefit in the Mideast and Athletic Conference of being the, the, the FBS conference that's right there with us is, is the ACC. Well, well the ACC is not yeah. very good. At, they're not very good at football. Um, and, then, I mean, outside of Clemson, and Florida State yesteryear, they're not very good at football. And so here in North Carolina, mm -hmm. North Carolina Central has just as much of a chance. North Carolina a t has just as much of a chance to go into a kid's living room and get a guy who has an offer from Wake Forest, Duke, NC State, yeah. uh, Chapel Hill, as, um, as, as they have to be able to try to come and get us. Like our coaches can go in those living rooms and do the same thing. And the same thing in Virginia. North Carolina State's coaches can go and get a guy who might have an offer from a UVA or a Virginia Tech. Same thing in Maryland. You know, honestly, the truth is that we don't have to compete against what you guys have to compete against in the SWAC, and that's the Southeastern Conference. You know, you think about Jackson is in Mississippi. Well, you got Ole Miss and you got Mississippi State. You're really genuinely having to compete against. Alabama State and Alabama A&M are in the state of Alabama. We know who's there in the SEC. And same thing, so on and so forth. And then it's going to get really interesting for Prairie View and Texas Southern who I believe have been able to get some really good guys when Texas comes to, mm -hmm. the, to the SEC. Then we'll see how yeah. that kind of shapes and folds from a recruiting standpoint. I still think Prairie View and Texas Southern will still be able to get the type of caliber players they want, but it's going to be relatively different and in a way that they haven't had to see or face in, very, in a very, very long time because, let's be honest, Texas just hasn't been very good since Vince Young uh, left out the door. So, you know, honestly, I, it's, it's just different here in North Carolina. Um, and it, it doesn't make it any easier that we're a basketball state. So, we well, hear it right here first. Uh, that is the kind of talk you can get used to of really getting into the exodus from BJ Jones and Joshua Simpson Senior and Erica, for that matter, trying to deal with these young gentlemen <laughs> in regards to keeping them on the path to make sure they give it. Uh, but I'm excited about uh, X's and O's. Uh, as it is coming, folks, or I should say it is here because you just heard it today. You've seen it as we kind of tease it and out. But make sure you follow uh, these guys in terms of uh, where you can get it. You can actually hit X's and O's on Twitter and follow them directly on their Twitter handle. I told you about the HBC Lives that you can see with B.J. Jones and Dr. Sims Sr. Uh, Tuesdays and Wednesdays. So follow them, like them, keep up with them because you're going to get some great HBCU news and analysis that you can't quite get anywhere else. With that being said, I want to say thank you for listening inside the HBCU Sports Lab. Make sure you share our podcast with your friends and colleagues. I am Dr. Kenyatta Khalil, the Dean of HBCU Sports, coming from inside the lab at the College of HBCU Sports with Mike Washington and Charles Bishop. Again, we want to thank you for listening to Dr. Khalil's Inside the HBCU Sports Lab with Mike Washington and Charles Bishop every Tuesday and Thursday right here at 6 o'clock Central Standard Time. Look forward to next week as we discuss the latest in the news. I want to thank our special guest, as we got Daryl Wade uh, from the Astros, the championship Astros, uh, B.J. Jones. Uh, I know you got to celebrate last year, but uh, we got it done <laughs> this year, so we'll smile with you a little bit. You know I had to throw one dig. Follow me, Dr. Kenyatta Cavill, on Twitter. That's D-R-K-E-N-Y-A-T-A-C-A-V-I-L on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. D-R-K-E-N-Y-A-T-A-C-A-V-I-L. Inside the HBC Sports Lab 1 on Twitter. Facebook and Instagram is YouTube inside the HBC Sports Lab. Make sure you download 
my JBN, my BCSN, if you want to continue to get this great content, uh, as you can see throughout the week, Tuesday and Thursday from inside the HBC Sports Lab with Mike, Charles, and myself. You also obviously get ONG Strike Zone on Wednesday. You get Saturday with Carlos Brown, and then on Sunday nights you get none other than uh, Brian and AD with the sports wraps. Continue to check us out. Uh, you know we do the games for you in all the groove of HVG Sports. Dream big. Continue to move forward. We will talk with you soon, Charles. Of course. Joshua? Legend. BJ? Dismissed. Appreciate y'all guys. Much love. ONG Strikes out.